Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to session five of uh, America's Navies, or the Americas series, as we've also called it, uh, a series of seminars that looks at uh, uh, maritime security issues, Navy strategic challenges, and navies of North, uh, Latin, and South America. My name is Sebastian Bruns. I'm the head of the Center for Maritime Strategy and Security at the Institute for Security Policy at Kiel University uh, in Northern Germany. Um, we work on sea power issues, on naval strategy, and the roles of maritime security and international relations. Um, and we are a nonprofit institution. Uh, the ISPK is uh, funded by an endowment, um, which uh, doesn't exclude that if you wish to interact with ISPK uh, on projects, please do reach out uh, to us uh, after the event. Um, today, we have two exciting sp uh, speakers here um, to wrap up this, uh, this series of seminars. Um, and as in the past, as in the past four sessions, uh, we will have both of them, uh, both of them will have the opportunity to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, give or take. Uh, and uh, then after the two presentations, we'll have uh, a moderated Q&A session. Um, and um, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you know about the particulars after the, uh, the two speakers have uh, finished uh, their talks. Um, our first guest is uh, Dr. P Tabitha Mallory. Um, she's a founder and CEO of the consulting firm China Ocean Institute, and she's an affiliate professor of the University of Washington Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. She specializes in Chinese foreign and environmental policy. She conducts research on China and global ocean governance and has published work on China's fisheries and oceans policy. She previously served as a postdoctoral research fellow in the Princeton Harbor China and the World Program. She holds a PhD with distinction in international relations from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SITES. She is currently a fellow in the National Committee in the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations Public Intellectuals Program. Professor, welcome aboard. Our Thank second speaker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Uh, welcome aboard. <laughs> Glad to have you here and. Uh, uh, I should also say you, it's, it's 7 a.m. in the morning uh, where you are, so very much appreciated that you're joining us uh, from, uh, from uh, the Pacific uh, or from, the, from, the, uh, from the, the West Coast of America, North America. Um, our second speaker, uh, making her, her debut in the Maritime Security uh, Conference Circle, but uh, I should say uh, uh, for at least since last year, uh, a colleague and a friend from Brazil is Andrea Resende de Souza. Uh, she is she's a PhD candidate in international relations at the Pontifical uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais. I'm not sure I, I really pronounced that right, uh, but it is in Brazil, um, and where she is developing a thesis about the United States overseas basing system. She holds a master's degree in international relations, also from the very same school, and she defended a dissertation, a master's dissertation, about the presence of U.S. naval forces in the South Atlantic. Very interesting thesis indeed. She's also a voluntary researcher in the simulation and scenarios laboratory of the Brazilian Naval War College. She's a member of the Corbett Center for Maritime Policy Studies and for the and, and works for the or has, has worked for the Center for International Maritime Security, SIMSEC. She has published articles on various subjects ranging from gunboat diplomacy to securitization in South America. Andrea Obrigado, and thank you for being, being on board. Um, uh, we look forward to both of your presentations, um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I want to thank the Center for uh, Strategy and Security for hosting me, and uh, for uh, thanks to Dr. Sebastian Bruns for inviting me, thanks to Henrik Schilling for setting all of this up, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I have some slides. I'm going to share my screen. Um, one moment. And I hope I can get that on full screen. There we go. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. So I'm going to talk about China's fishing operations in South America, and I have an outline of what I'm going to do. Um, I figured since most of my expertise is on China. And then, you know, since I'm from the United States, I thought I would start out by talking about China's distant water fishing policies. 
uh, and you know, starting out with some of their responses to the criticism about their operations and you know, their own growing awareness of their, their unsustainability for some of their operations. And then I'll touch upon, I think, what's really an important issue, which is the geopolitical motivations behind China's um, fishing fleet and policies. And then I'll talk a bit about one of those policies, which is the financing of these operations, the subsidies that are provided to the fleet. And I think a really great case study of this is looking at how they influenced the activity around the Galapagos that we saw last year. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about some of the shifts in uh, China's global fishing trends and how that's impacting South America. Uh, and then I'll speak a little bit about the overseas subsidiaries and bases that China has talk a little bit more about South America. And then I think as a, a really good segue into Andrea's portion, because she's done a lot of work on US presence in South America, I thought I'd speak a little bit about the US policy response to all of this. Because um, I think, you know, maybe some of the, you know, our European counterparts uh, don't really know as, you know, as much about this. this. There's been some really interesting developments, I think, lately. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so let's get started. So um, so China has, even though there's been, you know, three decades of expansion of China's distant water fishing industry, and I should quickly say just what the distant water fishing industry is. This is operations outside of China's own near seas. Uh, so outside of the East China Sea, South China Sea, Yellow Sea, uh, on the high seas, which belong to no country, and then in the exclusive economic zones of other countries, host countries, on the basis of bilateral fisheries access agreements. Uh, so they started their industry in 1985 is when it was launched. Uh, and for many years, it was just, you know, the policy was just to expand, build as many vessels as possible, find as many new fishing grounds. And then more recently, really in the past five or six years, we've seen a shift in that policy, which is largely in response to international criticism of what China has been doing. And uh, I think some awareness too, you know, as Chinese academics and experts go abroad and you know, kind of absorb some of the thinking from the international community on sustainable fishing, I think they've started to reevaluate some of their policies. Uh, and one of the big turning points also was the, um, the Argentine Coast Guard sinking of a Chinese fishing vessel in uh, March of 2016. And, you know, that was very embarrassing for the Chinese to have, you know, such international attention on, um, on something like that. So we've seen a whole host of policies that are, um, Kind of moderating the the fishing operations including a commitment in 2015 to reduce the subsidies that they're providing to the industry china is the world's largest subsidizer of its fishing industry so these are pretty you know large um, amounts that they're giving uh, they've strengthened their observer program for onboard the fishing vessels they built a distant water training and compliance center at shanghai ocean university to kind of you know bring up awareness of some of these issues with their own crew and companies um, they've issued some changes in their 13 five-year plans, um, particularly capping the number of vessels that they have and the number of companies. Uh, they've created an IUU uh, blacklist for uh, vessels and, and captains that violate, that fish illegally and violate some of the regulations, um, and take away some of their subsidies as punishment. Uh, last year, they issued new regulations, updated regulations this is the first time they've been updated since 2003 on the distant water fishing industry. And that's what the uh, image from the right hand side is, is that that document. And for the first time, these regulations include language on addressing IU fishing and um, some other, I think, progressive language. Uh, last year, they also issued uh, a policy establishing two high seas fishing moratoria, and these were in um, South America. Uh, and then uh, they've also just went into effect a couple months ago. There, there are new measures to report high seas transshipment, which I think a lot of people know is a problem, especially when you're trying to, you know, address IU fishing. That's a, an entry point for IU catch to, um, to enter the supply chain. Um, so this is, you know, so at least rhetorically, China recognizes that there's a problem, and I think that's really good. I think it's 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 you know important to um, acknowledge that they've you know that they've kind of realized this. That's kind of the first step. You know, in the past they said they had no problems, um, but I think a really important question is how is this going to be implemented and enforced? You know, the actual uh, actions behind all these policies really matter, and I think that is still unfolding. 
And so that brings me to another really important question. And there are a lot of geopolitical motivations behind China's policies. And we need to figure out a way to address these. So there, there are really numerous motivations for China's um, fishing, distant water fishing industry. You know, it started out because they were concerned about food security, uh, you know, their own economic um, issues in China with you know, unemployment in, in their fishery sector. Uh, but, but really, we also see layered on top of this, the geopolitical motivation. And so I think a lot of us are familiar with the 2012 18th Party Congress statement calling for building China into a maritime great power. And so a lot of us think about naval power when we think about that. Uh, but this was also including the distant water fishing industry. And so uh, the second quote I have on there is from an, an analyst in China um, saying that you know, after the 18th Party Congress, distant water fishing has met its strategic opportunity. And I've not seen uh, in official Chinese documents um, uh, call, calling the distant water fishing industry this, but I have seen in other documents from like companies and um, some academics calling the distant water fishing industry in China, China's second Navy. Um, so I think that's a really interesting kind of way that they're thinking about this. And certainly during the Cold War, we saw the Soviet Union use its distant water fishing industry to, you know, for reconnaissance and surveillance purposes. I'm not saying that China's doing that uh, right now, but I don't think it's you know, lost on them that there's that potential use uh, for the fishing fleet. Um, and then in 2013, the state council, which is the executive body in China that implements all the policies, they raised marine fisheries to a strategic industry. Um, and so this is also for the domestic industry. We've got the whole South China Sea issue. So it's a part of that too, uh, but this also applies to the distant water fleet. And so what I thought was a really interesting statement on China's thinking about distant water fishing, especially in the high seas. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the thinking on high seas later, but um, there is the former uh, deputy director of the uh, Bureau of Fisheries in China made this statement uh, it was in Chinese in a, in a speech that he gave. And he talks about how distant water fishing embodies China's presence on the high seas and advocates for China's rights and interests there. Um, and it elevates China's voice as a sovereign country and especially over the management and distribution of marine resources this is very important to them. And then it's breaking up the long-term monopoly of high seas resources by a few Western countries. Um, so we can see here, you know, there, the resources are a component and there's some interesting thinking about that too in China. I've heard a couple of people in China say that, well, because China has 19% of the world's population, they should also have 19% of the world's resources, at least in the commons. Um, but then also there's this, you know, other kind of layer of interest in asserting China's voice um, in some of the international organizations that govern resources and in our international system. Um, and so we can talk about this maybe more in the Q&A, but I think, you know, if we don't address some of these uh, motivations head on, you know, is there a way that we can, you know, make room for China's role uh, in a constructive way so that China is also playing a constructive part. We're all kind of working together instead of having it be one of friction and, and possibly worse, one of conflict. Um, so let me turn to talking about some of the, this is really kind of uh, getting into the subsidies policy. Um, so one of my uh, friends, colleagues, uh, Ian Ralby and I did uh, a paper last year on looking at the Chinese fleet around the Galapagos. This is the um, number of uh, fishing episodes uh, around the EEZ. You can see that line is the EEZ. And what's really interesting is if you dig into where the vessels there came from, um, we looked at, you know, which ones, just looking at the company names and addresses, you can figure out for the most part um, where they come from. And so the, the, the vast majority of the fleet was from Zhejiang province, which is the, China's largest fishing province, and it has a huge squid sector. And a lot of those fishing vessels were fishing for squid, um, which is unregulated largely on the high seas. Um, and then we see the second largest kind of um, contributor of the fleet was from Shandong province, which is in the north, and then some from Fujian. And if you look at, this is um, one of, one of the, uh, pol the subsidies policies that goes towards the distant water fishing industry, uh, you see that the money that those provinces get um, 
you know, really correlates with the share of catch that they're um, taking in. So on the, the left side, we've got, you know, Zhe Zhang's the number one uh, in terms of catch, you know, followed by Fujian and very closely by Shandong. And so it's it's no coincidence that Shandong, sorry, Zhe Zhang receives the most, um, or Sh Shandong actually receives the most, Zhe Zhang is second, and then Fujian. It's the, you know, the top three provinces in both cases. Um, so I think we see, you know, a really strong correlation uh, behind, you know, between the, the fishing and the uh, financing of this. And this is, of course, an issue that's being taken up at the WTO right now. So I think that's an, a really important factor when we think about this industry. And then uh, finally, as I said before, I would talk about some of the uh, global fishing trends. And uh, so I think a lot of us have heard of the going out policy that China issued to find markets and economic opportunities abroad. This is from 2001. And now it's kind of shifted into this coming back policy. And so this applies to the fishing industry as well. In the past, China sent um, most of its catch to local markets. Um, they didn't really have the capability to store it and ship it all the way back to China. Uh, but a lot of um, their policy has shifted into um, consolidating the supply chain from the point of harvest to the market. Um, and there's a lot of national pride in China of, you know, for the people being able to buy fish that was caught by their own fleet. And so you see this reflected in the uh, final destination for a lot of China's catch. So they, uh, in 2018, they sent 65% of it, their catch home, and that's an increase from 49%, um, really just like 10 years ago in 2009. And then you also see a shift towards high seas catch versus exclusive economic zone catch. Uh, and this is also in response to some of the criticism that the, the Chinese fleet has received for their operations in the EEZs of other countries, because um, I think there's a lot of understanding that a lot of that fishing is unsustainable. And so you've, um, the increase has gone from 43% of the catch being from the high seas up to 66% um, just a few years ago. Uh, and there's a photo of unloading the catch uh, from a reefer, a transport vessel in Zhejiang province. Um, and so uh, China has built up the infrastructure uh, in, uh, in China to accommodate uh, more landing of its catch on its shores. Uh, so the photo I just showed um, a moment ago, and then the top photo here is that fishing base domestically in Zhejiang province. That's the largest one. It was the first one that was built. And these are just built a few years ago. This was, I think, like 2017, 2018. There's one in Shandong province, that's the second photo, and uh, one that's, uh, I think, nearly completed in Fujian province. And so, you know, they're really building up um, the capability to bring more of this home. And what they're also doing is building overseas bases and subsidiaries uh, as part of the infrastructure for their catch as well. And for South America, we have, um, I've seen the reports that there are 24 subsidiaries uh, for Chinese fishing companies there. Uh, a number are in Argentina, um, some in Uruguay, and a couple in Suriname. There might be more, but um, this is what I could find from the Ministry of Commerce website. Uh, and then they're also setting up bases. The photo on the left side is a map uh, that I saw at that Zhejiang um, fishing base. And you can see South America, they've got the, the little, you know, little round circles is where they're building some bases abroad in order to support their fishing operations there. And so when, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. Um, I think some of this, this can, I think Andrea might talk about some of this and I think some of it can come out in the Q&A, but I wanna bring up some of the concerns about these operations for South American countries. I think, you know, number one, if you think about the impact, it's really a development issue for these countries. There's a, an impact on South American economies and livelihoods. If you've got outsiders coming in and taking the fish, you know, it means potentially less fish for the locals to, to catch, um, both industry and uh, there's often a lot of conflict with the artisanal um, fisheries as well. Um, and uh, there's also an impact on trade. Um, if I didn't show the chart of this, but if you look at the trade statistics, you know, as we've seen the increase in Chinese presence in South America, we've also seen South American countries exporting less catch to China. So the, um, it, you know, it's 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 hard to make. I think the real definitive connection, but. You know, the, the two correlate uh, in such a way that, you know, I, I think it's, it's possible that, 
you know, the Chinese have decided they're, they're going to come in and catch the fish themselves. Um, and so, you know, in that case, that means that the um, South American countries are capturing less of that, that value added. Um, and then uh, there's definitely an impact on ecology, uh, unsustainable fishing practices. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the, another big challenge is there's still a lot we don't even know about um, the ecologies of a lot of these places. And so, you know, going in and, and catching a lot of fish before we even have really good stock assessments is, you know, just generally not a great idea. Um, part of uh, the challenge is China's demand for fish as inputs into um, fish meal for its aquaculture industry. So a lot of the Peruvian anchoveta goes into this, for example. Um, and there's been some work talking about, you know, the impact of that on the, you know, the food supply chain. Um, and then, you know, so it's not just the fishing operations themselves, uh, but there are also an increasing number of mergers and acquisitions uh, by the Chinese of South American companies. And so I think this, you know, this brings up a, a big question about Latin America, South America, but I think Latin America, because it's also Central America too, um, you know, having control over their own fishing sector um, and not having, you know, the huge presence of outside fleets it's uh, most fisheries experts um, have shown that when you've got outside fleets coming in, they're just less concerned about sustainability because it impacts them less directly um, than it does in their own waters. And we've seen in China's waters that they've been very concerned about sustainability in their domestic waters. Um, so there's a bit of a divergence there when it comes to distant water fishing. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, do, do you want an outside party coming in and having so much of a say over these resources? I think the challenges come in when we're talking about the high seas, uh, but there's also a lot of fishing uh, in the EEZs of a lot of these South American countries too. Um, so I think hopefully in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit about, you know, how to approach this and um, some solutions and some of the challenges um, for addressing this problem. And then finally, I'll just talk really quickly about the U.S. response. Um, for someone who's been working on fisheries for a while, it's very exciting the last few years to see this, um, you know, this, this kind of policy interest on the part of the United States. And this predates the, the last Trump administration. I don't think he should get credit for this. Um, it's really been more at the, the civil service level over the years. I mean, it start, it's been, you know, from like 20 years ago that these uh, issues were, were coming up. And, and so finally, uh, a couple of years ago, our US Congress passed the Maritime Security and Fisheries Enforcement Act. Uh, and this is a, a whole of government approach to addressing IU fishing. And I'm not gonna read all those agencies, but there is an interagency working group that features 21 US agencies. And kind of the big ones are like the US Coast Guard, the US Navy, Department of State, uh, our NOAA, which is our fisheries um, uh, people, Department of Defense, um, and US trade organization, but you can see, you know, there's a bunch of agencies involved in this. And the nice thing about this too, at least from the US domestic politics perspective is, you know, it's, it's, it's really a nonpartisan issue. Both the Democrats and the Republicans are in support of addressing these issues more. So I think it's, you know, just from our domestic <laughs> politics, uh, this is something that everyone can get behind, which I think is good. Um, it's been funded by the, our National Defense Authorization Act the last couple of years, and most recently they have called for reports to Congress on IU fishing and distant water fishing. And I, I should also say that I'm focusing on China here, um, but it's not just China that has issues with IU fishing and um, distant water fishing, even in South America. You know, ta Taiwan is there, South Korea, Japan to a certain extent. Um, Russia, uh, so there are other, you know, distant water fishing nations and certainly other countries uh, with problems in, with IU fishing. And so the US is very interested in working with Latin American countries on addressing this. Um, I don't think they want to have a unilateral approach. I think this really requires, uh, a, you know, cooperation um, across the board, hopefully from European counterparts too, that would be great. And, you know, here I think it's, uh, it's it also is an issue that unifies people because most people agree that IU fishing is a problem, unlike the drug war, which, you know, for decades, the US has been pushing in Latin America uh, with really mixed results, uh, if, you know, maybe just even negative results. Um, so I think this is a more positive issue, you know, concerning the development for a lot of people. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm excited um, to see what comes out of this and how we can cooperate. So that is where I'll leave it. And hopefully that opens it up for Andrea to talk a little bit also about um, how to cooperate on this. Um, so thanks for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Without further ado, Andrea, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns, for the invitation. Thank you all for managing the time for being here. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, uh, just a, a second, please. So while it's loading, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, everyone is seeing? Yes? Oh. Um, Oh, it's my presentation would be more an overview of Brazilian Apple strategy. Uh, this image in the background is the Riachuelo, it's in all sea trials. I'll speak a, a little more about this. Um, so uh, a brief history. Uh, this vessel uh, on the background is the White Swan. It is the oldest sailing vessel that we have. Uh, it's the beautiful, most beautiful, I think. And let me talk a little, uh, uh, the Brazilian Navy uh, was created in 1822. Uh, it started as the Imperial Navy after the war of, for independence against Portugal. And um, uh, Brazil's, Brazil, the Brazilian Navy has participate, participated in several regional conflicts in the uh, 19th century and early 20, 20th century and participated of, uh, also of the both world wars. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it has participated in a lot of conflicts. Um, it's, it is the, Brazil is the one that is the country that spends the most in, in defense in all Latin America. As you can see in this uh, shot uh, of the military balance uh, of 2020. Uh, it has spent in 2019 27.5 billion dollars. Uh, it is a 20% increase from 2018. It has an active personnel from uh, of 267,000. Uh, from this number, uh, the Navy has uh, 18.5,000 per active personnel, being 16,000 uh, from the Marines. Um, it is uh, the Brazilian, the Brazil is part of the Zone of Peace of the South Atlantic. It's an uh, institution that unites both uh, three countries from South America, the Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina, and another uh, 21 countries from South Africa. It is part of the United Nations Commission for the Law of the Seas. It conducts regular exercises and operations with regional and extra-regional allies, like the UNITAS since uh, 1959, the Carabacs, and the Samar uh, that was conducted last year, last year with uh, India and the South Africa. And what it has participated in the United, uh, the Brazilian Navy has participa participated in peace missions in Angola in 95, Lebanon in 2011, in the Haiti from 2004 to 2017. So let's talk a little about the force structure, structure of the Navy. Uh, I must say that uh, most of the force structure that we have today, it was uh, built during, built or bought during the 70s and early 80s during the military dictatorship. And most, I believe half of, them, approximately half of them were built or bought uh, outside the country and the other half were built uh, in the country. So I believe uh, only a part of it was modernized in the early 2000s. Um, we have uh, six free, uh, ah, um, the Brazilian vessel has, I believe, uh, 112 vessels being divided in three main categories. Uh, the means of the fleet, the means of the district, and means of research. Uh, we have six three, six three vessels in the means of the fleet. 
the multipurpose helicopter carrier was recently com commissioned as an, uh, um, a carrier a carrier for uh, unmanned uh, aircraft, what is great for surveillance. Uh, the frigates, um, I believe five of them were modernized in the early 2000s. Um, the, we have four submarines for the Tupi class, one from the Tukuna class, and two from the Scorpion class that are in sea trials right now. That was the Riachuelo in the first slide. And all of them are conventional submarines. We do, do not have a nuclear submarine, submarine, but we have a submarine nuclear program since the 70s. Um, so uh, this is, this is to be, the to be, uh, submarine. I just wanted to, to bring a photo for you to see what we are talking about. Uh, this is the Tikuna. The, this is the Niteroi, um, the Niteroi class frig frigate. I believe this is the Independence. And so uh, the means of the districts. These are there are 20, 23 vessels, and most of them are used in the rivers. And let me show you the. This is the Oswaldo Cruz uh, hospital ship, probably doing an operation in the an isolated area in the north of the country. They bring, uh, they do a lot of operations uh, to provide uh, hospital care for people in those isolated areas. So we have the research vessels, uh, eleven research research vessels of uh, the, uh, all kinds. And we have eight aircrafts. This is the polar uh, vessel, uh, the polar ship, excuse me, Almirat Maximiliano. It was bought outside the country, I believe in the 80s for the pro uh, tactic program. And the Skyhawk. So uh, at the same time, Brasilia, Brazil's maritime uh, area is divided in nine, nine naval districts, uh, as you can see in the map uh, on the screen. But uh, as you can see, uh, the seventh district is in the center of Brazil. So you ask me, oh, how can that be? But uh, in the center of Brazil, there is no sea. Oh, however, Brazil has a lot of rivers. Uh, it's a big network of rivers. I believe there's uh, 42,000 kilometers of navigated waters. So it is a lot of waters. So it, th there is the necessity of have a district in the center of Brazil, even there is no sea in the center of Brazil. So in each district, the, let, me, let me back a little, in each district there is another base and another station. Um, and just let me remind that um, a naval strategy begins with naval, a maritime security. We cannot do a, a, a good naval strategy with, without a good maritime security. And that means take care of our inner waters too. Um, so uh, the latest, uh, in the, the first document released to the public by the Navy is the strategic plan of the Navy for 2040. I must say that this uh, effort for, not for to, just to bring the Navy for the 21st century, but it's an effort of more than 30 years of the new Republic, the new democratic, democratic era. Uh, when we started the democratic era in the 1986, uh, it, it began an effort to leave behind the shadows of the military dictatorship and the Cold War politics. This means to modernize the force structure of the, the armed forces, uh, this means uh, in 1999, uh, the command of the Navy was 
put under subordination of the, the recently created uh, Ministry of Defense. And they st the government started to release uh, several strategic documents and uh, national security documents like the White Book of Defense um, that started to, to brought uh, Brazil Brazil defense to the, the, the 20th century, like uh, halting now on cooperation and what we, we needed to do to, to have our forces to be more efficient and modernize them now. Uh, unfortunately, we have a major political crisis, economic crisis sub subsequently. Uh, so, last, finally, in last year, the Navy released this strategic plan. So, let's talk a little about it. So, uh, we first must learn two concepts. The first one is the strategic surroundings. The strategic surroundings is, was a concept developed in the 60s by a group of geographers. Uh, Actually, the, I must highlight that the main geographer responsible for this concept is uh, Terezinha de Castro, a brilliant woman. Uh, unfortunately, her concept uh, it only was uh, inserted in the documents in 2011. So it was a little time for, for bring this up, but uh, here we are. <laughs> so uh, the strategic surroundings uh, are all this space in the yellow lines. Uh, it's about 18 million square kilometers. Uh, it's out South Atlantic, uh, the west coast of Africa, and this part of the Antarctica. It's a big space. We need a uh, we need a constant surveillance of, on that. And we need, I believe the key to, to this surveillance is cooperation, as Dr. Tabita expressed earlier. I, 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 be, don't, I don't believe this can do without cooperation of the, our, our allies, our regional allies, including the United States. Um, the second concept is the blue Amazon. The blue Amazon is all this uh, blue area the, the clearer one and the, the stronger one. And it's included the territorial waters, the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. It's about 3.6 million per kilometers and it's reaching oil reserves and gas and fishing areas. Uh, it's, it's, th that's why it, it is called Amazon, Blue Amazon. Um, it's, all, it's, all, it's also where it's the pre-salt reserves are located. So it's vital for, for the Brazilian Navy to monitor this area constantly. Well, this brings us to the perceived threats that are, uh, that are in the, the strategic plan of the Navy. Well, there's piracy, illegal unreported and unregulated, unregulated fishing, uh, like the example that we had uh, last year uh, of the Chinese fishing vessels in Galapagos that did uh, a chaotic destruction of the Galapagos environment. Illegal access to fauna and flora technology and biopiracy, organized crime, terrorism, cyber threats, natural disasters and pandemics, and disputes for resources. See, these are not just concepts. These are real threats. Uh, I don't know if you all saw in the news, but uh, a couple month, months ago, uh, there was a, a leak of uh, almost virtually every single person of Brazil had his personal, uh, its personal data released to the dark web, mine included. Uh, so I believe the Navy has a, a, a lot of homework to do with cyber, cyber, cyber threats right now. Uh, it's, it was leaked from the, the government. I don't know. 
it is in, on, under investigation right now. So I don't have a lot to talk about it. Uh, so let me bring to another example beyond the, 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 the these two that were uh, exemplified right now. In 2019, we have a major oil spill in the coast of Brazil. Um, it brought uh, health issues for the population, this destructed the environment. It caused distress in the, in the economics because most of the population affected uh, depend on the, the fishing and tourism to live. And see, this happened in 2019. And I believe it was a major motivation for the 2000, uh, for the release of this plan in 2020. So, and it was before even the, the, the Chinese uh, illegal fishing vessels to be knocking at our door. So uh, this brings an emergency for us to be, to be able to modernize and being able to be, being able to, to do a, a better surveillance, to better monitor our, our waters. Um, so another part of the, the strategic plan that I want to talk is the strategic programs. I believe that, that is the, the, the most important part of the, the, the document. So they put uh, as strategic programs, the personal, this means uh, uh, invest in management uh, to improve the, the capabilities of the personal, uh, uh, intellectual development, physical healthcare programs, Olympic programs. Uh, there is a nuclear program. This means the nuclear, nuclear fuel cycle program and nuclear reactor. There are two sub programs essential to, the, to, the, the, to build the nuclear submarine. Uh, the maritime mentality that is also essential to the to create maritime awareness to to break the cycle of the sea blindness institutional sea blindness that affects not us but a lot of other countries. Uh, the full operational capacities making this means more modern more modern um, more modern facilities. Uh, extension of the sub uh, of the logistic support capacity of the operation means this means power projection, yes, power projection, uh, more power projection in the Amazon River in the South Atlantic. Uh, the last two blue Amazon's measurement system, also known as SIGAS, and the construction of the Naval Power Score. Uh, these two I will talk uh, more in the next two slides. So the SIGAS is uh, basically an uh, inter-network uh, system, a communica um, communications network system. And I will quote directly the, the pen because it's really technical. But mostly is to help the, the decision-making of the ships uh, in, during the surveillance and monitoring of the waters. So let me quote. Uh, the SIGAS has the objective to, provo to provide an integrated monitoring co and control of the jurisdic jurisdictional and international waters. In the SIGAS area of range, the monitoring systems provides a set of information that may contribute to an optimum, optimal decision making and, when applicable, the elaboration of acts against a threat or in an unidentified emergency. So, I don't uh, last uh, last week, it was released into, into space a uh, satellite that I think that may contribute to the the Sega system. So that's great. I I I see that we are stepping finally stepping towards a, a good a good start to to against the the threats that are knocking at the, knocking at our door. So the. Uh, the naval power course construction are uh, fundamentally four, four sub programs. The submarine program that uh, are building the Scorpion class programs that are in sea trials, the, the, first, uh, the first submarine in the first slide. Um, 
the tamandare fragrates that are substituting the 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 fragrates of the niterary class that I showed uh, before. The pro hydro that is the, the, the program for the acquisition of an uh, ice breaker ship for the Antarctic program. And the pro sumus that is a program for the improve the readiness and the logistic support for the Marines. And last but not least, I want to present to you the Brazilian Antarctic program. Uh, it is not a, a program under subordination of the Navy. It is under subordination of the Ministry of Defense. However, the Navy is, is the main, for, uh, it, it provides the main logistic support of this program. I believe uh, it, it, this would not have, this program would not happen without the support of the Navy. Uh, you saw in the previous slides that the, the pro hydro program is, is to board a, a, a nice breaker ship for this program. So you can see how important the Navy is for the Antarctic program and how the Navy sees an Antarctic as a, a, a priority area for its naval strategy. Uh, so I cannot express enough how this program is important for the naval strategy. So, uh, all being said, I believe the naval strategy has two issues. Budget, the Navy, uh, excuse me, the Navy has two issues. Budget, institutional sea blindness. However, these two issues are being overcome right now. First, budget. Uh, this, there is an old critic that the academics says about the budget in the Ahmed forces that 80 to 90 percent of the personnel of the uh, uh, 80 or 90 percent of the budget is spent on personnel. However, uh, I did a little research for this presentation, and this could be couldn't be farther from the truth. Well, six percent is spent. Uh, Twenty percent is spent on inactive personnel. That this means social security. And 66% is spent on national defense. From the 66%, 20% is spent on payments from for the active personnel. So it is spent a total of 40% for, for payment of personnel. So something is happening to change this. this. So I believe this critic. Uh, we need to further explore these and do not believe more these old critics, old, you know, uh, we need to, to also take a step forward to renew our studies, to, to see what's truly happening right now. And institutional sea blindness, uh, I believed that the economic crisis and the political the, the political crisis that a, a solid or country this few years uh, has put in us behind in so many levels. However, this uh, strategic plan, uh, it was released to the public. This was a major step. So I believe that is, is a step to, to break this institutional sea blindness, this lack of talk about how important the maritime and naval uh, strategic or, or the maritime security is important to the country, especially after so much uh, examples, uh, examples of, of issues like the oil spilling, like the Chinese fleet. Uh, you see, I believe that we are finally stepping forward um, so I, I thank you all for, for being here and I hope that you have a good day. If you have uh, any, any questions, I, I hope that you can come forward right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, and a job well done. Congratulations on your first, uh, on your first academic presentation. Um, and, uh, as they say, naval circles, bravo Zulu. But uh, I want to extend, of course, uh, my thanks uh, to Tabitha as well. Uh, I, I think both of you have given us a, an extremely useful insight into uh, 
the, the width and the breadth and the depth of maritime security, uh, ranging from uh, from protein politics, uh, if if you could say so, uh, to uh, to nuclear submarines, um, and and um, how all of this uh, in the in the virtue of South America, how these how these uh, different uh, perspectives, these different fields of study, uh, and these different problems really uh, uh, can interact. And uh, I look forward to uh, discussing some of it in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, and, and as everyone gather, gathers their thoughts, um, if you wish to ask a question, please just uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function and uh, you can just type in the question or type in your name or type in, I wanna ask a question and you'll be added to the list here. Um, and um, uh, if you have a question to a particular, to one of the two speakers, please identify, uh, or uh, if you wish both to, to answer, uh, then we can also do that. And as everyone is now gathering, their thoughts and their uh, their questions. Um, I have a, a couple of, of questions, real well, one question for each panelist. Um, uh, uh, and I'd like to start with uh, Tabitha, um, excuse me. Um, um, I thought it was very interesting to see, um, very encouraging, but it was very encouraging to see, um, and I wonder if you could expand a little bit on that, um, the, uh, the, the fact that the, U that the United States is recognizing that the Chinese Navy um, is not the singular, uh, the singular challenge uh, in terms of policy. Um, looking back, back at my time on the hill, on Capitol Hill 10 years ago, so it's been a while, but um, I don't think much has changed in terms of that the Chinese, or should we say the Chinese maritime challenge is often seen reflexively through a naval lens, which means uh, how many aircraft carriers do they have, and how many uh, how many uh, how many warships do they have, and how many do we have there? Um, and I I believe, and I, I'm I'm quite confident that I'm not overreaching. That uh, this this uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, uh, in that um, there needs to be a a maritime as opposed to a narrow naval uh, approach to to that problem. And and um, Evita, if you could uh, in a minute. Um, uh, expand a little bit on, the, on, on, on how you see this and, and you know, what are some of the challenges uh, also in terms of uh, getting naval assets and a naval mindset into this, this problem and addressing the problems. Uh, uh, recalling that I think last year, Southcom had uh, four, uh, uh, a total of four uh, Arleigh Burke uh, destroyers from the Navy uh, in, in, in uh, drug interdiction, which of course is, uh, is a bit over uh, overreaching as, as far as, as I'm concerned. So in a minute, uh, if you could respond to that. And Andrea, my question to you or my, my comment to you is, um, um, I thought uh, and I thought you were very much on point in that uh, um, I'll ask for permission to, to use that, uh, that saying that you had, uh, that naval strategy begins with maritime security and without maritime security, there can never be a naval strategy. Um, now, the, I'm not saying this lighthearted, uh, but uh, I think we had it uh, last Monday too. Uh, Brazil joins the uh, joins the, the the number of countries that have naval strategies, um, and Germany, of course, still doesn't have one. And uh, I see Heinz Dieter uh, in agreement with me. Uh, we are both uh, fighting for uh, have been fighting for for quite quite some time <laughs> to to get uh, Germany towards a, a true naval or at least a maritime strategy. Uh, and and uh, we're working on it, but that's not the point. The point, but my point is, uh, I thought it was interesting that it is a, a naval strategy, but still there's a lot of maritime security in there. Uh, 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 fisheries, uh, the the Antarctic, uh, the peacekeeping operations in the Mediterranean, of course, with uh, also with the uh, the Unifil mission uh, meeting the German Navy halfway sort of. Um, so um, I and I'm as someone who's been looking at naval strategies for a while. Uh, isn't that a bit overreaching? Isn't Brazil trying to, to do everything at once, uh, including the budget, uh, the institutional sea blindness, um, and uh, you know just uh, just doing everything at, at, at once? And I wonder where you see the, the, the two or three biggest challenges to that approach. Um, so if yeah, if you could if you could respond to that, but uh, yeah, first maybe Tabita. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was a, a great question, and I actually shared the same experience when I started working on fisheries issues. Um, uh, well, I guess I worked on environmental issues kind of first and then started narrowing in on, on fisheries. 
you know, maybe um, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, and I would, I would go sometimes to maritime security events and I'd be the only person there talking about fisheries and, and it didn't help that I was a woman. Most of the security community is dominated by men. And so I just kind of see people's eyes glaze over when I talked about the importance of fisheries. Um, so I, I am also really glad that there's kind of been a shift in um, realizing that maritime security is, is broader and including some of the non-traditional uh, maritime security issues. And, and there are a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of non-traditional security issues, and but then also a link to a lot of secure, like security issues kind of in a more traditional sense when it comes to fisheries in terms of like organized crime and, you know, links to, to things like that. Um, and, and so I, I think it's good that there's a shift in this approach. I also think um, it's it's challenging in many ways because, you know, a, a, an issue, I think one of the most interesting things about fisheries management is that it is interdisciplinary. So you need a lot of different people from different backgrounds to work together on the solutions because it impacts so many different just parts of our lives. Um, but, but that can be really challenging, uh, you know, and not just interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. You're bringing people you know, not just the academics, but, you know, government and lots of the government agencies. And then you've also got NGOs and uh, other international organizations. And so I, I think then coordination and communication become challenges. Um, and then you add, you know, all the different countries too, and, you know, their layers. So I, I think um, it's good we're realizing this, but, you know, it's, uh, there's still a lot of work to do in, in terms of how we coordinate our responses and getting the, you know, the four right, um, you know, as the means to, to do that. So I think it'll be really interesting. And I think when we think about China and China's place in the world, um, you know, having conversations, uh, you know, multilateral conversations involving lots of stakeholders will be just really important um, for addressing this and finding a way forward. Thank you. Andrea. So uh, I'll try to, to answer you. Uh, first, let me say that Br the Brazilian military is civil relations are very close. So uh, I cannot say very much, but I must say what I know that uh, there's a, a, a little they mistaken a little about how uh, what is maritime, what is naval. I, I think that is, uh, it is a common mistake, but uh, I see that Brazil with this uh, uh, strategy is trying to pinpoint all all that it that it need to do for yesterday. There is need to do with with uh, yes with urgently right now. It's everything at once. Uh, it seems so, but it's, it's more a pinpoint of what it's urgent, what it must be done uh, uh, for 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 not for us to, to not be behind the uh, uh, incorporation of other navies. Um, we have a, such a, a big area with, with to 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 surveil to monitor. And we must must not have the luxury to 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 have just a few ships or a few ships that are not modernized or modern enough. Um, I, I remember a, a thing that Doctor uh, Professor Geoffrey Hughes said uh, a few months ago in a podcast, the John Johnny Cole podcast, that uh, Navy is the biggest their commitment. And I'm seeing this right now. I, I was most a critic of the Navy for the lack of commitment. And I see they are making this commitment right now. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I, I must confess that I'm a, a, a bit uh, passionate a little for, for this, this stepping forward of the Navy. Uh, but they had a lot to prove yet. Uh, especially in, 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 in and all these programs that had started, the, the Tamandore program uh, with all this, these foreign companies uh, that are involved. And um, the Tamandore, the, uh, uh, you see, it's, I, I think the 
the Navy has finally awakened for, for the 21st century. But uh, I'm as I am passionate, but I'm sc skeptical at the same time. But I, I see more than a pinpoint that, that what it must be done than uh, um, everything at once. <sighs> Thank you. Um, nothing wrong with being passionate about uh, <laughs> what your study. I mean, we're, we're all spending, uh, if, it, if we weren't passionate about our subjects, we would be spending too much time in front of uh, reading about them. So uh, um, I think that's, uh, that's every, every, uh, every expert's uh, 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 challenge or everyone's challenge is to, to be an expert sort of, you know, remove, but also when you, when you love something that you work on so, so, so much, then of course you, you better be passionate. Um, so the first question now on my list is by Heinz Dieter Job, and uh, please just say a few, just say where you're from, so everybody knows uh, about it, and you've got the floor. Can you unmute yourself? We we don't hear you yet. So now you hear me? Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, a retired captain of the German Navy. And uh, for my question, maybe I should also mention I have worked for the arms control field uh, on the chemical weapons, but also on conventional weapons. Uh, in the past, uh, I have looked for some uh, beautiful weapons in Iraq after the first Iraq war. So. Therefore, I have been a little bit irritated by the presentation, Andrea, in, in the relation with the nuclear submarines. You have spoken about your limitations with the budgets. Well known, I think, all over the world. All the navies have problems with the, with the budgets. And you have spoken about the need uh, for modernization of the inventory of the navy. I'm fully d'accord with that. But with a nuclear reactor, that means a nuclear driven submarine. I have some concerns. Why? At a minimum from the past, I can remember the discussions specifically between Brazil and Argentina running for maybe nuclear weapons. And then there is the Treaty of Tratalolco. And in that, as far as I can remember, it is regulated that you only can run for the nuclear for peaceful use. So I have some doubts if a planning for nuclear driven submarines is still on the basis of that treaty. And if not, what about Argentina? Because I have the feeling then they will react. Do you really need for your naval strategy with the huge area, do you really need nuclear driven submarines? Maybe you can explain it a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Captain Job, it's a pleasure to know you. Uh, so <laughs> the nuclear program, submarine, nu nuclear submarine program, for me, it's a vortex of resources because it's from the 70s. It's from a military dictatorship uh, uh, time. It hasn't come anywhere. And we are in another time. And I don't think that we have used it for it anymore. I, I believe I was, I had another opinion in the past, but I talked with a lot of, of experts and I reflect, reflect a little on this. So I think that it's still waters. I, 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 in the treaty with Argentina, I believe that uh, there, is a, 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 there is not a clause that forbids a, 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 the, the Build the, 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 we cannot build a nuclear submarine uh, as it for it must be for Pacific use. Uh, since we are not, <laughs> it's another time. 
that time we when we made the the treaty with Argentina about the 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 nuclear treaty with Argentina uh, it was two two military dictatorships here and there uh, it was a, a there is a lot of competition for, for nuclear competition there and here. Uh, right now, uh, we have a, 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 a strong cooperation in the nuclear field. We have a, 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 a institution together. And since the, the nuclear submarine went nowhere, uh, I really don't think, I, I, my advisor used to say that uh they say oh the nuclear submarine will be ready tomorrow and when tomorrow comes they will be they will say oh we'll, it will be ready in the next 10 years so only time we'll say where it became i i don't think it, it, right now i think the focus of the navy is more of coastal water. I, I think all the navies right now are focusing more on the, the coastal waters. Um, so I don't think how a, a nuclear submarine would uh, make a difference right now. So the program is there. Uh, the technology may be used for uh, other, 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 other things. Uh, like we have uh, uh, nuclear facilities for uh, generate en 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 electrical energy. So I, 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 I really don't know how to say, uh, uh, to say, to, to explore any longer this answer, but I hope that, that I could say a little about the subject. Thank you. Um, Sebastian. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Justin. Uh, an additional remark and maybe also a question. As far, we have only nuclear-driven submarines by the processors of nuclear weapons, except of Israel. They still have only conventional-driven submarines, but India, Pakistan, France, UK, Russia, China, and the US, they have the nuclear-driven submarines, but they are accepted nuclear states. Therefore, it is my question, because in the moment I see really no need for running for just a con conventional thinking state like Brazil to run for nuclear driven submarines, beside of the budget problems and all the other things. Uh, but you have to mention, you have to look on your neighbors. And again, I have many, many doubts if you are really running in that direction what will happen in Argentina. And I think with all the problems you have described with piracy, with terrorism, with drug trafficking, drugs going from maybe from your country to West Africa and from West Africa to Europe, I think we commonly, not only from your country, we have enough to do with these threats. And uh, so therefore I would, at a minimum, I would prefer let it as it is, but no running for the future. Thanks. I agree. I agree. I agree with you. Thank you. Um, the next set of questions, he specifically said he wants to ask two questions. And that's obviously because he was a speaker uh, as last Monday, so he gets that privilege, is by Rafael Uribe. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rafael Uribe. I am a Colombian visa comfort researcher right now acting as an independent scholar. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for, for your valuable input. Um, Dr. Mallory, uh, I would like to ask a question about the incentives for Latin American countries to, to, to give some attention to the issues of, of, uh, of uh, irregular fishing. Um, specifically, because I have already, like, also reflected about this issue of drug trafficking. Like right now, there is this tendency, this uh, thinking change on, 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 on drug policy. Like, okay, maybe it's not the best way, like a military, like, militarized drug policy, is not, it is not the best way to approach things. And, but probably some resources that, which are devoted to uh, drug policy could be actually used to counter these threats in illegal fishing. But at the same time, 
I am not quite sure that Latin American countries have like the entice, the right enticement to protect their territorial waters. I mean, like if we look just at the number of uh, fishing industries, fishing enterprises, there are not, not, not that many. So maybe this is a powerful, powerful uh, like factor to have like probably the United States and the allied countries have not like the right partners right now to uh, like to, uh, to 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 make to make some changes in, in, in future policy. How is your view about that? Um, and Mr. Rosen, uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the uh, Tamandare project, uh, the replacement of the new frigates for the Brazilian Navy. As far as I know, there is a common like a joint enterprise with the German naval industry to build these these four vessels. Uh, could you please maybe provide us some information about how that's working, which are the strengths and which are probably the um, the weak points in this program? Because it's like basically the, 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 the same way how the Colombians are thinking uh, how to build their, 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 their fleet in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think it's it's a really important question. And um, so I guess a two part, part response in terms of the incentives for the countries to address IU fishing in terms of, you know, their kind of their, their own benefits from uh, more sustainable practices. I mean, you, you're, you're essentially uh, helping your own economies, you know, your own um, food security concerns uh, by managing the, the fisheries well and kind of uh, using them as resources for your own economy. So, you know, whether it's just kind of at subsistence level or you know, if you're doing fish processing, for example, and adding some, some value added there, you know, your country can then capture um, some of those benefits. Um, so I think there, you know, there, there are those incentives to have, you know, better policies on this. But, but I think you bring up a really big challenge in terms of the resources that are needed for this. I mean, the maritime space is huge. And so kind of our, our traditional means of monitoring control and surveillance, you know, through using vessels, which are fueled by um, fuel. And Andrea talked about the oil spill. And I think we're probably not gonna have time to get into the whole issue of climate change and managing that. But, um, you know, uh, that I think is a, a kind of backdrop issue. And so I, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, interesting new technologies that can help um, in, you know, in this area. Uh, um, you know, satellite technology, uh, you know, drone use, um, for example, for monitoring control and surveillance. Um, I mean, it requires some uh, changing of evidentiary laws to get this kind of put in place. Um, and it definitely requires some assistance, uh, you know, from other countries, I think, uh, to, to do this, because even, you know, that's high tech. But once you, you know, I think uh, once you have some of that in place, the technology actually means that on an ongoing basis, it can be less costly because you're not paying for, you know, fuel inputs for, you know, a whole um, naval fleet to go or Coast Guard fleet to go patrol those waters, so. Oh, hi, Rafael. Uh, uh, about the, the Tamandare program, uh, I believe there are four vessels being built uh, for, uh, they will uh, be released in four years, four or five years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there are a lot of companies involved, like the Embraer, it's a, a Brazilian company, and the Tissing Group, it's a series of uh, consortium of, of, of uh, uh, companies. Uh, what, is, what is great because I believe that not uh, we would not manage to do it alone. And they are uh, modern. They are more modern vessels, uh, especially for the uh, surveillance and monitoring of the Blue Amazon area. And I cannot say any longer. I need to further explore uh, uh, the program, but. Uh, I believe there are, are uh, this new acquisition will come uh, a little bit late, but in a very good time because the vessels uh, leave the the Niterói class of frigates uh, are 
from the 70s so they are very old uh, even that if they are uh, they were modernized in, in the 2000s they are, are really old and even if they are doing their job right now uh in five five years i don't know so it's good that the the navy is investing in new vessels right now i believe that uh, there is also more to come i believe Thank you, Andrea. Um, perhaps as a, as a bit of a segue here, um, uh, in uh, session two of uh, America's Navies, we had a, a presentation by a representative from uh, Diamond Shipyards in the Netherlands about the Americas as a market. And uh, I commend you, I recommend you to, uh, if you're interested in that, to go and uh, visit our website, klcpowerseries.com, uh, where we have recordings of that event too. Um, and you can rewatch it. Um, uh, and uh, my, my comment here is uh, that, um, South America obviously is, is a very dynamic uh, uh, naval market uh, with French and German and Dutch shipbuilders among others uh, trying to trying to uh, uh, make make some segue in um, and uh, I think it's it is it is quite a sign that um, if I informed correctly Tuskegee Marine Systems uh, bought a, a shipyard in Brazil a whole shipyard uh, and renamed it uh, to, uh, uh, to to build the future uh, part of that future fleet. Um, and uh, it, it should be should come as no surprise that I think Europeans would be very interested to have uh, uh, South American navies uh, if and once they venture out into places like the Mediterranean um, or if European navies come to the Caribbean um, uh, that there would be a high degree of interoperability and a sort of the same or similar standards um, and, and I think that's that's something that's uh, that's worthwhile more more of a discussion. Um, so on my list is uh, Tabitha now, please. Question for Andrea. Yeah, so uh, Andrea, I thought your presentation was great. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting is uh, I didn't realize that uh, Brazil had so many rivers and that was such a, you know, a, a need for the uh, purpose of the Navy. And I guess some of that is because the Brazilian Navy plays a Coast Guard function too. But I was just curious about, um, you know, just kind of more details about what some of the security threats that you're dealing with um, on the rivers. Um, I would imagine maybe it's mostly domestic issues, but um, yeah, I was just kind of curious uh, about that. So traps on the rivers, uh, there is a lot of illegal fishing outside of the, the season, uh, illegal trafficking, uh, drugs, traffic of people, guns, um, I, I can say, uh, spend all day here listing, but it, especially in the north of the country where, where uh, uh, the potentially navigator waters are, are in the more volume because of the Amazon River um, and, and because of the connection with other countries too. Um, it's, it's a vast network. It's, it's a big, big, big region to, to surveil. And I think that the, the Navy does a great job with its resources. There are not a lot of resources, but it does a, a great job with the few resources that it is. In, during the pandemics, they are able to do a lot of operations, uh, bring assistance to the people, but also because sometimes we don't, do not see uh, how, how this, uh, how, how pandemics are a, a major threat right now. Uh, I believe this pandemic, this, this COVID-19 pandemic uh, brought this to our attention and in there, they are doing a great job and they are uh, bringing their support to, to uh, so isolated areas that uh, they're only possible to, to arrive by, by ship. So uh, even uh, by foot, it's very difficult to, to arrive. So we need them to, to be there uh, surveilling with vessels, more vessels if possible, not because of the quantity, but quantity and quality of vessels to, to surveil those waters because it's a vastity of waters. We have a lot of things going on at once and these people need it. Uh, we have a lot of things going on and 
a lot of things. Uh, I believe I can say it, but uh, one of the the simulations that we had uh, uh, practice on the uh, the, the uh, last last year was uh, apprehension of uh, of a ship that contained a. Uh, uh, women's that were uh, being trafficked. It was a simulation, but is a, a, a real deal. It's, it, 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 it's, it is happening right now. So for me, that, that I am serial, it, it brings to me the sense that uh, how how badly we need to to to, to perceive these as a big deal. A, a, a real thing and not just a concept or a thing in a paper. Uh, so uh, this is it. Thank you for, for your question. Thank you, Andrea. I, I, you're touching on a subject there that we haven't discussed yet, and uh, but I will use this, this the, the opportunity uh, because you're mentioning um, some of the uh, domestic challenges, security problems that that Brazil um, uh, is experiencing, I, I, you know, trying to put it diplomatically. Um, and I wonder, uh, next year, I understand there's going to be a, a presidential election. Mr. Bolsonaro, um, who's been a very su strong supporter of Mr. Trump, for instance, is looking for re-election. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to speculate about domestic politics, but I, I do wonder, uh, do you see that maritime security might become an issue in the one issue in the presidential elections, or is it for the for the Brazilian public? Is it uh, you know unimportant? I believe I must say that is an unimportant. I wish I could say otherwise, but I in the last elections, I believe just one candidate uh, said about uh, a maritime, a specific maritime issue. And I was glad that he brought the subject, and I, so I wish, I wish the other candidates brought this, but none of them said anything about it. And uh, President Bolsonaro's uh, government did not uh, do a good good job in in the cooperation issue. So uh, all this time I was afraid that all, all cooperation efforts that we had done in the last decades was going to be thrown out the, 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 the window. Uh, thank you. Thankfully, this was not the case because the Navy was part of the state and of the, the government. Uh, uh, just uh, just to, to say here that I didn't say in the beginning, but I do not uh, express the the opinions of the the my university or the navy, but I believe that this subject will will not be brought in a few years. For I I, can, I I'm maybe mistaken. I'm maybe surprised, but I don't think so. Uh, however, uh, the uh, former president Lula uh, said something about the Navy it was not uh, completely true, but he said it about, uh, uh, a couple of days ago in an interview. I was, I was surprised, even if it, it was not completely true what he said, but he, he brought subject. So uh, Brazil is a Pandora's box right now. Uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, uh, I didn't want to, didn't mean to put you on the spot, uh, and hence I will also uh, not ask any questions or make any comments. No, about, no, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's it's uh, one of the, the parts of being Brazilian to, to talk about politics. <laughs> and politics <laughs> right now, it's as always been difficult. As it, you know, it's it's either politics or football, and I didn't I didn't know which one. As a German, obviously, I'm sorry. I have to I have to refer to it. Um, I didn't know which one I should. Uh, both are a minefield as for a German uh, talking to a Brazilian. So, but I, I appreciate your your openness. 
Um, and and I want to thank both speakers uh, for their uh, for their insight and presentations today. Um, there's a, uh, a a function at the bottom of your screen called reactions, and you can give the speakers a, a thumbs up or a, a heart or a, a just a, a cheering um, uh, instead of the the academic uh, cheering that you'd usually get. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Andrea and Tavita, for uh, for to uh, for, for coming us for to us today uh, for for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, thank you for everyone to everyone who uh, participated. All of you are obviously very much welcome to uh, follow KLC Power Series, that is at C Power Series on Twitter, um, uh, and to stay up to date on what we do. Uh, obviously, as Europeans, we'll be uh, pretty much taken up by the Baltic and the Mediterranean, but we will continue to look at the Americas um, uh, for, uh, for, for the future. And hopefully there will be some more cooperation uh, coming up uh, and opportunities to interact and hopefully to meet in person in the future um, to, uh, to make this world a, bit, a little bit safer. Um, once again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, uh, have a great day. Um, stay healthy, both mentally and physically, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.